I'm gonna I'm gonna start recording, and I'm recording now. This is the Brother Ron show, and the reason why I'm doing this is because um, I'm supposed to do this show for a very long time, and I want it to be informal. I don't want to leave this to transatlantic. Now, Minister Clemson Brown he passed away a couple of weeks ago, and he's now buried, which means that you know I have to come out and hide in, and I have to start the Brother Ron show. This mm -hmm. might be the first show if I release it or not, but today's date is, uh, let's see here, um, today's date is August 22nd, um, mm -hmm. 2023, and I'll make the show more formal and nice and everything. So everybody out there, I won't tell you my full name yet, but call me Brother Ron for now. I have a very important friend on the line. He's calling from Kenya. And hopefully, if I get the strength, if I get enough comments about the show, and if I get the support, look in the descriptions for email address to my friend that we're going to talk to from Kenya. And um, you'll see where to support the Brother on show in the comments. If you never see this show again, it's because I haven't received enough support. Ha ha ha. I can no longer fight for my people eating oodles and noodles. Am I correct, my brother? <laughs> so now I'm in Jamaica, and this brother here is a brother that's from Jamaica originally. And, um, you know, um, his story is very important because we're going to call him Mr. Big Heart for now. And the reason why I connect with this brother because this brother is a doer. He is in Kenya, and he owns nine acres. And he's farmed on 17, and he has his, his challenges. And I'm going to just ask a few questions, get some short answers. Okay, so welcome to the Brother Run Show. This is one of my shows. I don't know if it's the first or whatever, but I wanted to do this just talking to you because I, I got to get this story out there. What? What? inspired you to be a Pan-Africanist? Who, what, where, why? Give me two minutes. Who are you? What are you? Why are you the way you are? What drives you? So I'll give you three minutes. I'm going to put myself on mute. You give the world three minutes. We want to get to know you. Go ahead, Mr. Big Heart. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, well, to answer your question, I'm originally from uh, Brooklyn, New York. My mother is from Jamaica. My father is uh, Black American, both Afro-descendant parents. Um, and I grew up in a time in the 80s and 90s um, where we saw a lot of injustices, uh, specifically in the areas of police brutality. My mother was a very militant woman, um, very active in the community um, there in Brooklyn. Um, very active in and around the slave theater um, in Brook, the historic slave theater in Brooklyn. Um, I, I went to school on Fulton Street, my high school, Boys and Girls High School. Um, and I was really influenced by people like Jack Felder, um, Sonny Carson, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. These were people that I had met firsthand. Um, and around the time we had the incidents of Michael Griffith, Eleanor Bumpers, um, Yusuf Hawkins, Abner Louima, all of those things I witnessed growing up. So those things um, helped me to kind of uh, ignite something inside of me to really understand um, what, 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 what our role as Black people in this world are. And, uh, and it kind of took me a, a, in, in a lot of places, specifically in the Nation of Islam, um, there in Brooklyn, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. Uh, and in my 30s, I, you know, working in corporate America, I really developed a desire um, to exit America, uh, specifically around 2013. Um, at the time, I was married to a Kenyan woman, and I made my first trip to Africa to meet her family. And um, I really liked it. I started to ponder possibilities on how I could make it. And as soon as I got back to America, uh, about two years later, I was divorced, but I started to practice those things um, that 
and research things that would help me become more independent as, as opposed to relying on corporate infrastructure. Um, I had an apartment at that time in Washington, D.C. I started growing food on my balcony. Um, I was I was moderately successful, you know, just doing research and things like that. Uh, and then an opportunity came about in a, uh, around um, 2017. Uh, where I purchased an uh, acre and a half of land in a place called Martinsburg, West Virginia, which is about an hour and a half from D.C. So it allowed me to commute to work um, and home uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and and at, on that land, I decided to start to grow my own food uh, while at the same time pursuing some opportunities in my mother's home country of Jamaica. Uh, and then I started to explore uh, what I could do as far as securing land. And then I, I, I really thought that this was something that I was preparing for for retirement. I'm 48 now. So I was looking down the line more like around 55 years old, uh, something like that. Um, so I started going to Jamaica, started to explore, saw those possibilities. I got my Jamaican citizenship. Uh, and then I got my Jamaican passport, got my TRN number, started going around the island, started driving, getting really familiar specifically with the western part of the island, West Milan uh, area, um, uh, and, and just, just those, 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 that part of Jamaica for the most part. And then I, you know, end up driving the whole island and, and learning how things work there and I saw that hey this is something I can really do my family had historically has land so that is entitled so I wanted to go and meet a surveyor and see what the taxes were do on that and then make that happen uh, some things happen where a few things fell through in Jamaica wasn't getting the cooperation um, so things were kind of delayed so I they couldn't move as fast as I wanted to in Jamaica and then the pandemic hit all right, so pandemic hit, I'm stuck in the house working from home, but I really got into the garden. I bought goats in West Virginia. I started, I had got goats, sheep, turkeys, ducks, chickens, rabbits, I had like a hundred rabbits, I had like uh, 30 chickens. Uh, and I never had, I never even had a dog or a cat before. Uh, and I just started studying and, and really, doing very well, um, slaughtering chickens, eating my own chickens, ducks, uh, learn how to slaughter rabbits, learn how to grow food. And I grew a lot of food. I just threw anything, any seed into the ground, fertilized it, cultivated it, and everything grew. And I just started giving away food. Um, you know, the, the pandemic really afforded me the opportunity to be able to, to, to see that I was actually good at farming. But then the idea hit me in my mind because uh, I had been to Africa several times at that point that um, if I can do this in America, I can do this on a grander scale in Africa. Why not do it now? Um, so in January of 2020, 2021, I put a three month, I gave my job a three month load notice that um, I'm leaving. So by March, I, I I left the job. I decided that I would sell my house in West Virginia. I gave away I gave away everything. I, I gave away everything except the house. I sold the house, um, and then I decided that that uh, Africa would be the place because I knew Africa. The cost of living is very low, um, and you know things weren't coming through in Jamaica. So I said Africa might be the best bet. And that was always my dream um, to do so. Uh, so that's how I ended up here to begin with. I know I went a little over, but that's my story. No, you didn't go over. This is Brother Ron. Remember, this is probably my first show. Um, we're on the on the ground right now, and uh, that was a great story. And there's a lot more we're going to hear from you, Mr. Big Heart. Now... All right, let's start, start asking you some real nice questions now. Lovely. You painted a pretty picture. So now, um, Jamaican, Nation of Islam, Kenya, America. Hmm. Tell us 
What does Dr. Henry Clark mean to you? Tell us the impact of Dr. Henry Clark or your favorite uh, Pan-Africanist. Tell us, Gavi, who inspires you? Give me about five names. Why they inspire you individually? Talk to me. And go long. Don't worry about... We want to hear... We want to know who you are. Go ahead. I mean, well, you know, as far as, of course, you know, growing up in a Jamaican household with a with a <clears throat> a black conscious mother, you know, Marcus Garvey is definitely going to be first and foremost godfather of Pan Africanism, or you know, one of them, the most well known. Um, you 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 hear all the names, right? You hear Chancellor Williams, Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, J. Rogers, uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Um, so many names that you hear. Um, that you just come to love and adore. And throughout the years, I, I would say 30 years for me, I was 30 years ago, I was 18. And that's when I really started taking on a mind of my own. I, I remember being at uh, somewhere with my mother uh, at an auditorium in Brooklyn when I was young, Dr. Betty Shabazz was speaking. Um, she, my mother went to school at Medgar Evers where Dr. Shabazz was speaking. So again, I, I grew up around this stuff. And I, she was like, do you know who that is? And I didn't know who it was. And she was like, you need to get more into your, um, your learn more about your black history. And that just gave me the green light on that. So, you know, you, you hear the names, you have adoration, but people that are pivotal to me are people that mostly I met and I actually got to see their work as opposed to just hearing them speak. Uh, first person that comes to mind that actually moved me to do something was uh, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. Uh, in 1991, at my high school, he gave a speech called, uh, around the time the movie Jungle Fever came out, and the, they were handing out flyers. At, at that time, they were having the African Street Festival at Boys and Girls High School Field. So uh, they were handing out flyers and with him. I didn't know who he was at the time, and the title of the flyer said, No Goddamn Jungle Fever for the Black Man, Black by Popular Demand. Um, I took the flyer, went to go see him in the auditorium, uh, and from that day, I, I was with I was with the movement of anything, anything dealing with black people. I, I wanted to be around blackness. I wanted to support black businesses. Uh, food from black restaurants just tasted better to me. Um, I was just I was just wrapped up into it. So Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, um, being one of them, uh, I would say. Uh, Glenn Ford, I don't know if you're familiar with Glenn Ford from Black Agenda Report, um, one of my heroes, someone that is um, one of the best investigative reporters that I've seen, I've ever seen, um, someone that, 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 that really was committed to the progress of Black people and, and, and opening my eyes to many things, including in the area of politics. Uh, someone like um, Dr. Wesley Muhammad, uh, who does a lot of teachings in the areas of um, Black Islam and the African origins, African origins of Islam, as opposed to the current Arabized version of Islam. Um, so those those three uh, come to mind, and then uh, Mr. Silas Muhammad, uh, who is the leader of the Lost Foundation of Islam someone who spent 17 years going back and forth to the United Nations and helped give us the designation of Afro-descendant, working with a bunch of other Afro-descendant uh, groups of people in the Caribbean, Central America, South America. Um, and of course, I have, uh, you know, my own mentor, uh, brother who was my captain in Baltimore, it goes by the name of Malik Jihad. He's, of course, he's not famous, but his brother had been a Vietnam veteran, and he, and he was like a father to me, you know. So, and he taught me many things. Uh, from he's not a scholar, but he he was well he he was well versed in many things, and he was also well versed in manhood, which a lot of um, he taught me how to change tires, change brakes, change oil, you know, how to be a man. Uh, something that you know, you don't necessarily get from scholars and that, that all black men need if, if, you know, their father didn't provide that to them. 
Mark. So th those are the people that, that I could name and among the many, but those I have firsthand um, experience with and I've actually seen them in action. Um, Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, I spent some time in Atlanta. Um, he had always been my hero. This was about a year before he passed away, 1999, 2000. Um, we got to interact with him with the, um, he was there with the Black Panther, New Black Panther Party. Um, and again, all my dreams came true just meeting him because he was very personable, very warm, very receiving, but he was very strong and firm which is something that I, I was I was real pleased and I always cherish um, those moments with him uh, before he passed. So yeah, that's that's about it on, you know, as far as, you know, the people that I've seen things, you know, the list can go on, Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, uh, George Jackson, but those people I don't know. I didn't get to see them in action or things like that. and. I guess that's why I favor people who I've met, and that's what inspires me to actually do by watching them do what they have done. Now, now t there's a sound in the background. Is that television or radio? Or no, I live. I'm, I live in a Muslim area, so they're doing the call to prayer now. Um, so I don't know if you can hear it clearly, but they they have these big megaphones. So in this area of Kenya on the coast. This is the this is the Swahili coast. So this is your lar the largest Muslim area. And most of the Muslims in Kenya live in this area, just on the Indian Ocean. Um, there's a lot of history here too. There's there you can actually see the old slave castles here. Of course there's no tourists. It's not like West Africa. There's no tourism around that. They're just ancient ruins, but you can actually see the old slave forts still standing on the beaches here in Mombasa. It's a very old city, very old, city. very historic city as well, uh, especially around the, the Arab trading and stuff like that into Africa. Very so tell important. us, tell yeah, us. that's the moment. Yes, sir. So tell us mm -hmm. where you are now. Um, there's a little pet peeve I have spiritually. You know, whenever I awake to the spiritual moment, there's always a sound distraction. But that was pleasantly received <laughs> because I'm saying to myself, what the hell, man? Every time I try to start a show, do something, whether the phone rings, they're trying to get at me. <laughs> but <laughs> right. so you're this currently time. you're currently in where are you exactly how long you've been there? And uh, what has been, we're not going to go, because I want to, this is the Brother Ron show, the first show. And I have the first um, random Pan-Africanist brother. And I'm going to tell people, if you want to reach to the show or talk to me, you could email me at brother Ron. So that's two R's and two N. Does that make sense? Brother Ron and the number one at gmail.com. So if anybody want to be on the show or, you know, we're about bringing Pan-Africanist home. Our great Clemson Brown has passed away, the man who built this network, and I helped him to build this network for the past eight years. I'm the guy behind the scenes that you don't see or hear about. But now that our leader has transitioned, um, I have to now be more active in engaging with the audience. Now that I've learned so much from the leaders, the Dr. Clark and such, but this is not about me. When I find individuals that I consider a modern day activist, not through the vocal, not through talking, but tr through doing, this is a fellow Jamaican brother. Now, I've lived in the States for 31 years in New York, Brooklyn. So you're a Brooklyn Knight. I'm a Brooklyn Knight. I went to Wingate High School. And um, so we're coming from the same places. We're becoming elders. I'm 50. You're 48. It's our turn. You know, 
we have technology at our disposal, and um, it's our turn now to wake up the other brothers, to unite. Well, you'll know about me, I don't like the word unity. So we had to create something in Jamaica called Agenda Unity. Unity will never work. And, but Agenda Unity was always working. Different belief systems will always cause disunity. But Agenda is the Pan-African or perish. One of my focus is Pan-Africanism or perish. Now, that's what the great Dr. Henry Clark said. And that's what we're taking from this. It's Pan-Africanism or perish. And what I'm going to ask you now is to talk to me about your experience in Kenya, farming, what was it like in um, going there? starting a business, the challenges. Because ultimately what this show wants to do is to link like-minded brothers and sisters with this brother we call Big Heart. He has nine acres of land owned in Kenya. And through the challenges in farming, he has some challenges. But now this brother needs some strength. He needs a team. So in the description below this video, you will see how to reach to him. The purpose of this show is to make that spiritual connection. He's made it back to Africa. He's farmed, he's supported the community, but he needs more strength. The fact that he has nine acres, it means you guys could do Airbnb or business together. Now that he has learned. Now what I want you to do for our audience is to, from a business aspect, tell them what you've, you've learned, whether it be the, the cost of dressmaking, tell them about the farming business, tell them about your challenges. You have about five minutes, 10 minutes. When the plane touched down, what was the process? What were the challenges, the paperwork, the vaccination, the cost of rent, the the cost for the taxi cab, the transfer rate of money. Paint me a visual picture from the day you decided to leave the States from farming and take that plane and bring me up till today. You have about 10 minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, so I arrived in Kenya June 18, 2021. Um... At that time, the goal was not to stay in Kenya. Kenya was just supposed to be the first country I stayed in and use that as a launching pad and explore several countries to be able to determine which country would be the final landing place. Um, at that time, I stayed in the capital of Nairobi. Um, I, I, told you my ex-wife was Kenyan. We'd met in the States 12 years prior. So I stayed with former in-laws initially. About two weeks later, I found my own place there in the capital city, north of in the northern part of the city, um, near a place called Fika in um, Nairobi. And I rented my apartment there. It was a one bedroom and the cost of it was about $150 a month. Um, I chose that particular area because I knew it would be a process of transition from 100% Western life to Kenyan life. But I knew ultimately I would end up in a place where I would become a totally different person because of the things that I was about to embark on in the area of farming. So I stayed there. I stayed in Kenya in that apartment uh, the first three months. Uh, during that time, I learned about navigating the immigration system, uh, found, met, met a few people, and at that time I applied for a permit to stay. Um, and that was a month 
that was two months in. So the after the third month, my my tourist visa would expire. So I would have to exit Kenya. I knew that because I planned for that. Um, so the next place I went to was Uganda. Um, Uganda, because of the pandemic at that time, they had very aggressive um, COVID guidelines in all areas of life. So the first thing is you couldn't even enter Uganda without having a negative COVID test. So when you get to the airport, you present your negative COVID test. And mind you, these are like $50 a pop every time you take the test. Uh, and, and I think in Malawi, where I went to, and I'll tell you about that, now, uh, it was close to $100. So you get the negative COVID test, you take it to Uganda, you land at the airport. When they find out that you haven't been vaccinated, as I am not, um, they take you again. They took a busload of us to another place um, where you had, where they would test you again. So before you could even enter Uganda, they take you to another place, which was like the grounds of this big hotel. Uh, you sit in the courtyard, and there were a bunch of vendors there, just more, just a way to grab more money because you had to buy food from the vendors there and stuff like that. And you had to pay for the test again, another fifty dollars. I tried to, I don't know if I'm telling too much, but I'm just being transparent here. So I entered Kenya on my US passport. I also have a Jamaican passport. So I wanted, because for Americans, every time, every visa, every country, every Sub-Saharan African country, you have to apply for a visa. Jamaicans, Africa loves Jamaica, so you can, pretty much traveled throughout Africa visa-free on a Jamaican passport. So I wanted to enter Uganda with my Jamaican passport. They looked through my Jamaican passport at the airport. They said, well, how did you leave Kenya? And I showed them my U.S. passport. They're like, well, you have to enter on the U.S. passport. So they got another $50 visa fee. from. So before I even stepped foot in Uganda, it was another $150. It didn't start too well. So I got to you, got to my place in Uganda. I got to look around a little bit. They had a, they had a in, in Kampala, in the capital city, Kampala, and there was a very aggressive curfew. So their curfew at that time was 7 p.m. In Nairobi, the curfew was 10 p.m. Um, and it was loosely enforced. So you know, even 10 p.m. came, people were still out and about even partying in some places. But Uganda was very strictly enforced. There were roadblocks everywhere. Um, and then the, the traffic in Kampala is very tight. So rush hour, it can easily take you, if you're going even one mile, one kilometer, it can take you easily two hours to get from one point to the other during rush hour. So you can imagine all these people trying to scramble home. So if you don't finish what you're doing, in that day in Uganda by 3 p.m., you're not going to make it back to where you belong at 7. Um, and you don't want to get caught on the street at that time. And so so I, that was another bad taste in my mouth. So I had about enough of that in Uganda for about a week. And I really had high hopes for Uganda being what the destination. I'd really done my research, but it's just too much hassle. And to kind of add insult to injury, just leaving the airport in Uganda, there was another issue with leaving the airport. I, a lot of questions, you know, when you present that American passport, this seems to be a whole bunch of problems uh, with, with immigration posts throughout Africa. So leaving the airport in Uganda, I was asked them many questions and then ultimately said, well, before you leave, I'm, I'm leaving Uganda not to come back to America or go back to Kenya, I'm going to Malawi. I have my ticket. They're asking me, why are you going to Malawi? Why aren't you going back to America? Before you leave, you have to purchase a ticket to America before we let you through. I almost missed my flight. And um, luckily, I had a first class ticket from Uganda to Malawi, and the air hostess was waiting for me to escort me to the lounge. And she kind of stood up for me and was like, hey, this guy, he's okay. Let him through. So they finally let me through. I, bought, I had to buy the ticket anyway. I had to cancel the ticket as soon as I got through. Um, 
and I made it to Malawi. I presented my Jamaican passport at the airport of Malawi, and they were just like, hey, welcome to Malawi. These were the friendliest people you ever wanted to meet on the face of the earth. Malawi, I, I'm going to talk about Malawi. Malawi is a, is a, they call it the smiling coast of Africa. Malawi is a very sweet place. So I stayed about six weeks in Malawi. <clears throat> the goal of going to Malawi was to be able to, because it's a small country, you can kind of transit to several other countries and explore. Mind you, this is still my fact-finding mission uh, in Africa to see where my final resting place would be. Um, Malawi had great potential. And I would have eventually stayed in Malawi, but Malawi, because of the infrastructure, they don't have kind of that second tier apartment living. So in these places, you kind of have your expat housing. You have like middle tier housing, kind of where your middle class lives, like where I was staying in Nairobi for like $150, $200 a month. Then you have slums, right? So, and then all the stuff in between the middle class and the slum. But Malawi just kind of has like the expat area where rent is very high, and then you have slums. Very few of them, that middle ground area. So most people who are middle class, they don't rent. They have their own property, so they own. So kind of the rental market for that middle area of people is not there. So it was very hard. If I had found an apartment in Malawi, I would be speaking to you speaking to you from Malawi today, because that was, because I really like Malawi. And the goal, the, the reason I like Malawi is because Malawi is kind of the central point between the two, two of the largest markets in Africa, which would be Kenya and South Africa. And there's a, actually a well-paved good road highway that goes from Kenya to South Africa through Malawi. And there's a lot of farming and land is very cheap in Malawi. Um, between Malawi and Zambia, these are some of the lowest population density countries. Um, Zambia is one of the lowest population density countries on earth. You can drive to these countries for kilometers and kilometers and you don't see people. You just see land, virgin soil, ripe land. So you have a lot of foreign investment in Malawi via farming, uh, retail business, things of that nature because the, the opportunities are endless in Malawi. So I stayed, spent some time in Malawi. I went by bus, local bus through, and that was an adventure in itself, uh, from the capital the long way to the second largest city, which is the, re, the commercial hub of Malawi, another city called Blantyre. I checked Blantyre out and the goal was to be able to get into Mozambique because Mozambique is not far from Blantyre. Um, but because of, you know, those countries, again, because the, you know, the, the infrastructure, it's, it's hard sometimes to get uh, transportation. And I'm, I'm trying to navigate these things 100% with no contact. A lot of times I'm in places, I'm the only one that speaks English. I have to really dig for someone that, that can actually remotely understand what I'm saying. Um, so I went to Blantyre, I, I really didn't feel like I could get around and it would be very risky to go into Mozambique because Mozambique, the infrastructure is worse than Malawi. So I, I really didn't feel comfortable and they don't even speak in there. They're, that's a Portuguese country. So for me to try to navigate, it was the, the degree of difficulty in navigating Malawi and then going to a country where no English is spoken, I just didn't want to take that risk, even though I really wish I did, because ultimately I learned that many of the farmers that were expelled from Zimbabwe, they ended up in uh, Mozambique. And you talk about people that own 100, 500, 1,000 hectares of land. And a hectare is two and a half acres. You're talking about not a thousand acres, a thousand hectares of land. So you're talking about people that own whole villages. Um, and many of those farmers have found um, from Zimbabwe, they found uh, a life in Mozambique. Mozambique is, is, is a very good place um, if you want land as well. 
So the next option, I went to a place called Chipata in Zambia. So from Lilongwe to Chipata is about four hours um, by road. You go through the border checkpoint. You saw um, the Jamaican passport. I was, and I, again, I was allowed to enter visa free. Um, checked out Chipata. Chipata was very nice also. Um, when you're talking about in these places, land is about $300 per acre. Again, the low density. So, and a lot of the younger population, they're actually moving to the capital cities of these countries. They're not interested in living in the countryside. They're not interested in farming. They just want to go and look jobs and look for jobs and um, get a, live a cosmopolitan life. Um, I really like Chipata also. Um, it's just that I also in a situation where housing was not readily readily available, and I didn't think I haven't had enough time, and I didn't want to live in hotels indefinitely, just trying to look for an apartment. So I went back to Malawi again, and then there was another place. And all of these places I had researched before I even got to Africa, Chipata, uh, Lilongwe in uh, Malawi. And then there was another city, um, Mbeya, which is in Tanzania. Um, but that part of Tanzania is closer to Zambia and Malawi. So I took a nine-hour bus ride from um, uh, Lilongwe to the Tanzania border. Uh, it was the most interesting bus ride of my life. It was, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should go into that here, but it, it was very interesting. You know, when you take those local buses, you really get a feel of a country. Uh, you really get a feel of Africa. I don't recommend it for everybody, but um, it, it's something to behold doing that. So got to the Tanzanian border, made it through, went to Mbeya, saw Mbeya. Mbeya was good, but it wasn't as good to me as Malawi and Tanzania. While in Tanzania, though, I was able to apply and get a business registered in Tanzania, which would have also been able to help me to get a visa to stay in Tanzania indefinitely. Um, but I, I just wanted that as an option um, once I decided where to land. So once I got back to Malawi and continued the apartment search, I got a call from Kenya that my permit had been approved. And that was, that was the, that was, I was very, I was extremely torn. But I knew I would, at that point I would have to go to Kenya because it just didn't make sense to spend another three months in another country, not knowing what my status was. At least I had a permit to stay somewhere for two years. And I, I had to come back to Kenya. I decided to come back to Kenya. And I was very torn. I mean, I don't cry for many things, but that, I was on the verge of tears because Malawi is a wonderful place. And the people are very good people. Um, and I did rent six, ac six acres. Um, I met someone, I rented six acres, and I, I got the foundation for, in Malawi, um, to plant peanuts, they call it groundnuts. Um, groundnuts are you, the big crop in Milan, groundnuts and soya beans, because uh, they're export ready crops and they do well in that soil there and they get plenty of rain. It's very ideal for farming. Um, it's just that many people don't do it on an industrial level because of lack of resources. Um, but yeah, they did very well with the groundnuts. Um, I haven't been able to make it back to Malawi at any point um, to check it out. So that, but I, I, I get to see regular communications and they're doing very well. So I went back to the, went came back to Kenya. I knew at that point I would not stay in Nairobi. Um, so I had found a place, um, the place where I ultimately bought the land um, near a town called Loitokto. This is in the Kilimanjaro region, um, south central Kenya, um, near the Tanzanian border. Um, and it, it had promise because uh, the, the, there was a lot of farming being done there at the time. Uh, so I started to, you know, kind of go around that particular area 
and see what was going on. I settled down in a place called Rumble, but I passed this particular town called Kimana. And I was like, there seems to be a lot of commercial activity going on. It's a very small town in a village, a village area, but it's, 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 it's big for that particular area. It's like a small commercial hub because this is where like 80% of tomatoes in Kenya come from. Um, so I met someone in that place, Kimana. We developed a friendship. And then ultimately, they found me some land to lease in Kimana. So I moved from Rumbo to Kimana. I leased the, my first five acres of land. Um, and then I started to grow tomatoes. At the same time, before I went, just before, when I first came back to Kenya, I had begun a partnership with someone who had a restaurant that needed help. So there was a small restaurant um, that they had, and I decided to help them out, uh, where they were only making the equivalent of about $25 a day. I was able to add a few things here and there for them to be able to expand their menu options. I took them from making $25 to $50 a day. I sourced them with wholesale, wholesale products because they were just buying things at the retail level to stock the shop. I took them to wholesalers. We started getting wholesale items. Uh, so they were able to keep the majority of the profit. Just prior to that, because that restaurant was in Nairobi, I was able to hook them up with, with lock them into the food delivery services. There, there's Uber Eats there. There's another thing called Boat Food. And then there's another service called Global. Um, around that time, so I would go back and forth between Nairobi and Kimana. Uh, and I had a system where because Kimana is so far from manufacturing centers, I would buy manufactured goods such as dresses, uh, uh, secondhand items, and um, so just the dresses and manufactured items. I would buy, I would bring it from Nairobi, bring it to Kimana, sell it in Kimana and the surrounding areas. And then from Kimana, I would take the, the whole, the, the produce, the tomatoes, the onions, the potatoes, the beans, et cetera, take them to Nairobi to the restaurant. So that way they're getting things farm fresh uh, at, at a fraction of the cost that they were paying in Nairobi. So I had a system where at no time am I traveling between Nairobi and Kimana and my car is empty. I have something that I'm selling that I would subsidize the actual fuel that I was consuming. Um, at some point, the person, their eyes that I was dealing with in the hotel, they call the restaurants hotels here. So, uh, sorry about that. So, the at the restaurant, um, they started to get greedy. So, that relationship was starting to deteriorate. Um, and then the demands of the farm started to come under. So, at some point, the relationship with the restaurant in Nairobi, it, it fell apart. Um, I couldn't get them to buy into the long-term vision, like, hey, you can actually make $100 a day, which is nothing to America, right? But it's huge in Kenya. With, you figure if, you're, if, you're a hotel, if your restaurant rent, the, the, the rent the place is only about $100, you make that money in a day, the rest of it is profit. Um, and then there were other opportunities to expand into other business areas. Uh, I had even had a, a little vegetable stand built in front because I had excess produce that I was bringing from Kimana to Nairobi. So I was like, just build a vegetable stand, sell the vegetables, and whatever you need for the restaurant, just take it and cook it in the restaurant and just make sure you're tracking it. But since you, there's no, no refrigeration, no things to store, no space to store it, just hold this vegetable stand so that way you can sell this as fast as you can. I'll just make sure I ship things from Kimana to Nairobi if I'm not coming myself. Um, so at some point, I got underway with the tomato business. Uh, I was growing tomatoes on the five acres of land that I had in Kimana. 
And um, it was doing very well. You know, at that time, uh, the crates, a crate of tomatoes was going anywhere from about $50 to $70. And on any given day, you can, if you, if you, um, on a harvest day, so you're harvesting tomatoes about twice a week. So any given day, you can sell anywhere from 10 to about, my best day was about 100 crates of tomatoes um, on a harvest day. So how that process works is brokers, they come, they compete for, with prices. Two or three brokers might come and say, hey, we want to buy your tomatoes today. I have a buyer in town. How much do you want? Then another broker comes and just let them fight it out. Some of them would literally be fighting with each other for the tomatoes because that was their daily bread. Um, so you let them come harvest. You have to hire the uh, hire the harvesters. So there's like this cent town center where all of the harvesters they sit. You go, you pick them up, you bring, you negotiate what you pay them. And usually it's based on what they're, you're getting paid for the crates. Um, so you, you pay them. They do the it's just an all-day affair just to harvest. Um, so that season in itself, it went well. It was just short of three months uh, between the first harvest and the last harvest. I actually made a profit. But the big, the first big mistake I made in Africa is that I didn't do su succession planting. So halfway during the harvest, the harvest season, that three month period, I should have been planning for the next set of tomatoes. But I just was so much into getting learning about this particular uh, business in, in the beginning that I didn't think about succession planning. I just wanted to see what everything looked like wrapped up in the end. So once the season was over, there was about a three month gap between the last harvest in the first season and the first harvest in the second season. That three month gap, it cost a lot of money because I'm operating pretty much without any income. So everything is being sunk in. And also what I did is I that where the five acres were, I expanded I rented two more acres, so that brought that total up to seven acres. And then someone came to me and said there was another 10 acres somewhere else with better soil, this beautiful red soil. Um, and that was for rent too. So I'm expanding to 17 acres. I have nothing coming in. So that was a big hole. So I got a new manager for the farm, a very good guy who used to do mining in Tanzania. He's from the Luo tribe, the same tribe as Barack Obama. And it started out well. You know, he was a great manager of men. He and I, we had a great rapport. Um, he was someone that was kicked out of Tanzania uh, because, uh, you know, he was just a uh, collateral damage because of uh, the, the relationship. You know, it was difficult for Kenyans to get permanent status. So he was kicked out of Tanzania and lost all his money. So he was just down on his luck, but a very good manager of men, very knowledgeable about farming. Um, and we worked together, we put together a team. I had about 11 people under my staff and the, the logistics of the way that the farming works is that you hire the farmers on three month intervals. You hire them, you give them a three month contract, you supply their food, clothing and shelter. And at the end you pay them for the three months. Um, so during that time, they're doing everything for you. They're actually living at the farm because this farm, these two farms were close to the wildlife area. The wildlife area is near Amboseli National Park. So you, any given time, you can have a whole family of elephants, a whole family of giraffe, maybe a cheetah, some monkeys, impalas, and they love veg fruits and vegetables. Like a herd of elephants can clear out several acres of tomatoes or watermelons in within the matter of hours, and you've lost all your money. So you need farmers at the at the farm, 24 hours a day. Um, so we, you know, the, my 
my manager, his name was Omundi, uh, and he was very good at what he did. We, we started out very well. And then around July of last year, he got sick. I went to Nairobi for two days. I came back. They said Omundi was has been in the house for two days. He couldn't breathe. I went to go see what's going on with him. The guy was wheezing. Um, took him to the clinic and said he has to go to the hospital. Took him to the hospital. Uh, come to find out, yeah, I knew he had asthma. Come to find out he had pneumonia and he had tuberculosis. Um, and Monday passed away in 10 days. Um, on me, I had to manage all of these things. So once when he went into the hospital, I had to step up my, um, excuse me, I had to step up my my interactions on the farm. So that includes I had to step up my Swahili. I had to learn very fast about fertilizers and insecticides and things of that nature. While he was in the hospital, we would communicate and he would tell me what to do. And I'm writing everything down, make sure I'm tracking everything and planning out myself what is what what should be done for a while i was good with it but ah it, the management started to suffer because once he was out of the picture i couldn't be at once because when there were two of us we could at least keep an eye on things but all hell kind of broke broke loose there was a soft mutiny where people you know once you leave the farm people were not doing work um, things will really suffer. I, you know, the way that water got to the farm is that there were springs from Kilimanjaro that you would pump water from to the farm. And in many cases, this is like 500 meters from the spring to the farm. So you had to have a, a pipe infrastructure of these uh, polyurethane pipes. Um, and you had to have two pumps <clears throat> for each farm. Uh, one, of, one of the pumps got stolen. Just there was just a lot. So the people that were there when a money went into the hospital, a month later, there all of them were gone. All eleven guys were gone, and there were a new eleven guys on the team that I had to go find. Um, for the seventeen acres, <clears throat> I had um, seven acres of tomatoes. I had four acres of uh, sweet peppers, they call it pili pili ho ho, in with these are the green bell peppers, sweet peppers that uh, that everyone is familiar with, um, and these are at good prices. And then, so that's about 11 acres. So I had six acres. What I decided to do is um, I looked at what Kenyans were eating every day, the everyday Kenyan, average Kenyan. And they eat a lot of leafy green vegetables. They here they call them kumawiki, and then there's spinach, and then there's another one called manavu. They have two types of manavu. They have the manavu kenyeji, which is kind of the original, it's bitter uh, green leaf vegetable, and then there's a sweeter one called manavu kuba or manavu mzungu. Um, and then I grew something called chicha, kunde, terere. These are different leafy vegetables, you know, the Kenyan, every day a Kenyan is going to eat this. Uh, they're going to eat their ugali, which is pounded uh, corn or maize. And that's their, <coughs> that's kind of like their rice and peas for Kenya, right? So it's something that they're going to eat every day. Um, or their fufu, some is their staple food. And they're going to eat one of these greens. So I had about four acres of these greens, and then I had the rest of it filled out with assorted things. Just throwing every seed in the ground, pretty much what I did in America, to see what, what will be successful. And the beauty of that system is that as we waited for the tomatoes and the ojo to come to fruit, the, um, the, the four acres of green, leafy vegetables, they call it um, boga. So the boga, the four acres of boga, that's something that sells every day. You harvest every day, you sell every day. So I had to hire two women to kind of manage that part, to cultivate, 
to Chuma, which is to harvest. And then I had went to about 50 different, they call them mama and bogus. These are women that they have their little stalls. They sell it at various points around town. And they sell this, this these leafy vegetables around town. So I went to about 50 of them. I took their number. I took like a kg kilogram of spinach to each one of them. I was like, here is a kilogram of squirted spinach. We want to deliver you boga. So I got 50 mamas. I got one of the ladies to call everyone to take orders. And then that was a very good business. So as money was running out from planting the ho-ho and the tomatoes, um, the boga business was bringing things in because that was something that was cash flow every single day. So that would help me get the gas for my, my pumps. That would help me buy the food for the farmers and all of the little incidental costs that I had. Um, and then ultimately the tomatoes came into fruition, the ho-ho came into fruition. Um, but the, the worst part was the management of the personnel. Um, because of the language barrier, I lost my manager. So, you know, they were just going, they were just running wild. Ultimately, I hired two new managers, but they just were not as good as a home. Um, they were good, but they just weren't that good. They, they, um, you know, Monday managed with an iron fist. Uh, these men ran over these two new managers. And no matter who I tried, they just wouldn't do it. They, they, the only person they would listen to was me. So I would con always constantly have to intervene and I couldn't really focus on the business side. Um, and then there was an issue where these guys really didn't have the knowledge of uh, pesticides. So at one point I lost two acres of tomatoes just to insects, right? These white flies, because it was a very dry area on top of it. So the only place where there's water are these springs that are coming from Kilimanjaro, but everywhere else is like a desert. So you, when you don't have rain, you get a lot of these insects that attack the fruits of the plants. Um, so you have to double down on the insecticide. Nobody wants to spray a, lot, a bunch of insecticides on fruits and vegetables. So went through that, and um, you know, and the price of tomatoes plummeted. Also, so like I said, the during the first season. Price of tomatoes were like fifty to seventy dollars per crate. The price of tomatoes went down to like ten dollars per crate. But there was a reason for that because there's a, there was another because of the dry season. There was a marsh area that dries out every year at the same time, and then a lot of new farm, new new tomato plantations pop up there while the waters have receded. So you're talking about 100 acres of tomato supply there. So that caused the price to plummet on the tomatoes. But that was something that you only had to withstand for about six weeks, um, which I was holding on. I was trying to increase the, uh, the boga business, which was still flowing smooth, but just dealing with the personnel sometimes. I went through like three or four sets of women. Because after two weeks, they just stopped working, or they just the work would slow down, or they just didn't have interest. So you had to have it was high turnover. Um, so you just have to work with that. Um, at one point, I cut out the brokers completely, um, and then I started. I had two vehicles. I had like a station wagon type deal, which is a very good utility vehicle in Kenya, very good business vehicle. Uh, they call it a, a Toyota Pro Box. And then I had a sport utility vehicle, a Toyota Prado. I took the back seats out. I would take the I would take the tomatoes. I'm fighting not to speak Swahili. I would take the tomatoes. Uh, they call them nyanya. I would take the tomatoes to market myself, two to three hours away, closer to Nairobi, um, where they have big markets. And usually, the people that are selling the tomatoes at these markets were sold, bought the tomatoes from brokers. And those brokers bought it from the brokers who were buying it from my farm. So me, I'm being the one that actually grows it and I'm taking it to the farm so I can offer it for a lower price, being that price was so low. I was successful at that whenever I went out with, uh, with, uh, with my 
grotto filled with tomatoes. I came back, the tomatoes were gone. Like you could, you could, you could finish tomatoes in a day. You could sell all the tomatoes in a day at a good price. Um, but it was still problematic because every time I left the farm to do that, some an issue would pop up at the farm. So I decided to start to send the managers out, and then I'd send the managers out. And a couple of times they would go, one would go somewhere. And they would come back with all the tomatoes with excuses that, hey, you know, there was a problem, blah, blah, blah. But I knew personally, I was like, anytime I go anywhere in Nairobi, I don't even know what I'm going to Nairobi on that day, but I know I'm going to sell these tomatoes, right? Because we're, we're, we're the best price in town, right? You know, you talk about a situation where on a normal day, a normal person would sell tomato for like a, one tomato for a dime. I can sell about, 10 tomatoes for the equivalent of 50 cents or one tomato for five cents. I could chop the, the price in half. So there's no way you can't come out without this. You, you should be able to come, you should come back with these tomatoes. Um, so that was starting to break down, but things were turning the corner where we started to get, buyers started to get wind of the types of things, the diversity of things I was growing on the farm. So somebody different was coming every day offering to buy something and they were coming from further away so even where i am now in mombasa which is about five hours from my farm people were buying from mombasa from my farm to bring to mombasa because in mombasa they don't grow a lot of food um but it was just i was spinning trying to spin a lot of place to keep these things afloat um I mean, barely making it, but I was a, I was making it because I was making it happen. Um, but the thing that the final death blow to everything, and I, and again, I just needed about two more weeks to withstand the price of tomatoes because ultimately, tomato prices went back up. I caught malaria and pneumonia. I don't know, hey, pneumonia is bad enough, right? But you, you come now with malaria. I had never been sick like that in my life. I just noticed one day there was like, I was feeling achy. And then like my breathing was a little off and I was just, I would like wear these t-shirts. And it's like, at the end of the day, it felt like I was taking a shower in those t-shirts. That's how much I was sweating. Um, I was like, I, I can't go to that hospital where Monday died in because because of the bad service he was receiving there. I had to go out there and curse out some doctor. I was like, why is this man just, he just literally laid there for 10 days with an oxygen mask, no treatment. And they were trying to give me a hard time and I had to be a little bit of an asshole there. Um, so I was like, if I go to that hospital and they see me, I'm going to die. So I had to stay in the house. I had the worst headache, it was the worst headache I've ever had in my life. It was all day. I wasn't eating. I just lay in the bed with the lights off. The headache was so bad and it's constant. I thought I was losing my mind. Um, I would get moments of reprieve, maybe about 15 to 30 minute window in that day where the headache would not go away, but it would just subside in me. Where I could put on my clothes real quick, go to the pharmacy, pick up medication, come back home, take the medication, go back down before the headache came. I did that for about a week. Um, I thought it was just my blood pressure going up, but once I got the blood pressure down, and I was like, no, this is something else. And then I was able to diagnose that it was because of the, the because of my temperature and because of my breathing, that it was possibly Nairobi. Mind you, again, there's a drought, so this place is very dusty. You're just breathing dust all day. So I was like, this is pneumonia. Got the antibiotics, the pneumonia, and that went down. Ultimately, because of the aches, I figured that it was also malaria. So after about a week of that, going back and forth, I finally got where the headaches were. And that was the worst part. Um, the sweats went away, the breathing got better, but I was still very weak after the incident. I would go out to the farm, 
There were actually incidents at the farm because of the drought. This is in the Maasai area of Kenya. The Maasais are pastoralists. And these pastoralists, they have large herds, 50, 100, 1,000 heads of cattle, goats, sheep, things like that. And they only graze. They don't feed these cows. They do 100% grazing. So you have this, this dry area, desert looking area, and the only oasis in the middle of that is by those springs and your farm. Those are the only green areas. So they don't, they love their animals more than human beings. And the minute you turn your back, they're gonna let their animals run into you. So there was an ongoing dispute, even where I'm having a dispute with the chief and tell him like, hey, what's going on? You can't do this. You gotta tell your people not doing this, you know. But they still do did it anyway. And tensions were running high. So by the time I got back on my feet from being sick, I would go to the farm and then I'd be so weak and I'm like, these people ran down on me today. I can't even fight them because I'm so weak. Um, so at that point, I said, this is a lot. This is too much, and I gotta get out of here. So I left the farm to everyone, to the farmers, because remember we had these three month contracts. So I was like, look, at this rate, you just work the farm, you keep the farm, because these were leased lands. You keep the farm, you make the money. I already showed you how to work the boga business. You know all my vendors, you go deliver to them. You know all the brokers, you sell the nyanya, the, I mean, the tomatoes and the, and the, the, the peppers and you pay yourself from that. And at that point, I went to Nairobi, I spent some time, I sold one of my cars. Um, I stayed in Nairobi for three months. I pivoted to doing a lot of things online, the, you know, the uh, content creation, uh, website design, graphic design, um, it's just so just a bunch of things and the free coloring books uh, that are sold on Amazon. And uh, at some point in Nairobi, I said, well, you know, Nairobi, there's nothing really to do in Nairobi that doesn't cost money. Just go to the coast. At least the beach is there. The life, the quality of life is a little better. People are nicer. The cost of living is lower. Just try what, see what you can do in the coast. So now I'm in the coast coastal area of Kenya in the city of Mombasa. I've been here for about five months and uh, that's where I am. And, hope, and the, the goal is to always get back to farming. I still have the nine acres in Rumble. Um, I just have to dig uh, a well there. The, the water table is about 30 meters down on average in this particular area as I'm told. It's virgin soil. So even when I plant this land, you don't even have to use so many fertilizers, so many, because there's thousands of years worth of animal poop here mixed in with the soil. It's pure, it's virgin. Like you, I don't know if you've ever walked on pure virgin soil, like only animals and Maasai people have touched. Like it's like walking on a sponge, like pure land, like that hasn't been touched. You know, these Maasai areas, weren't even touched by colonial administrations because the Maasai vigorously fought these colonies. So their land is pure. I've never seen pure soil in my entire life, but in this area, pure, pure. Like you walk on it, it's like walking on a carpet like that. Not grass, it's just bare soil. So yeah, so the goal is to go back and do farming at some point because as I saw, by me, it's easy. If you have food in Kenya, it will be sold. It's just that a lot of people don't have the resources to grow food. <clears throat> One and two, no part of the food system, food su local food supply system is subsidized. So it's 100% entrepreneurial. The farmers either win or they fail. But either way, the government subsidizes no part of it. So you have, so Kenyans basically have to pray that someone has the entrepreneurial spirit to grow food and make some money. Otherwise, the food system is totally dependent on chance. And as I was telling you before in our conversation, that there are violent swings in 
in the cost of food. So like tomatoes can go up to like $100 per crate one day. And I heard like a month ago that they were $3 a crate. That's how violent the swings are. That's because, again, there's, there's no there's no mechanism to stabilize those prices because it's not subsidized on any level. And again, the delivery system wholly dependent on the Kenyan people. And there's not a lot of people with the means that are able to do that. So you're going to see a lot of food prices, a lot of things. And, and Kenya has a lot of potential, a lot of potential when it comes to food. And that's pretty much where I am right now. Hopefully I didn't go over on that either. No, 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 no. Um, this is Brother Ron's show, number one. Now, this is what you call progress. Information. Learning. Um, our brother here gave us a real visual idea, real life experience of what it's like to be a Pan-Africanist. Now, I hear a lot of sickness between two parties here. First question for you, and there's a lot of other questions. We're going to continue on this discussion. You know, the title more, you know, Mr. Big Heart, friend of mine, Pan-Africanist, just like myself. And while you're talking, I'm listening to your expertise. And some said to me, just don't give out this man email. If anybody wants to reach Mr. Big Heart, reach out to the emails on the screen. Reach out to me, and we'll do some screening. You know, because, you know, your knowledge is important to transfer. And the people who want to also team up with you to make sure this farming can become a reality. You became our Gavi on the ground. You came from Jamaica, Brooklyn, US, Kenya, Africa, business, sickness. Your story, your journey, the experience, it's wonderful. I think you've succeeded because in every quest we have as Pan-Africanists, someone has to go first. Someone has to pave the way. For us, you're that person. You have nine acres of land. And anything I do is about doing. Not talking, but doing. And this is why I respect you. And this is why this is the great way to start a show of mine. As Pan-Africanists, I myself, we do things. We build products. We make money. For us, it's black power money. Um, you need team members now. You need people, brothers and sisters like yourself. And with your expertise, this is the kind of forum and the kind of connectivities we need to have as a people. And... Since we're becoming the ancestors, we're getting older. Our ancestors building the foundation for us, for, for us to have this conversation, a productive one, a one where when someone listened to you, listened to your ability to communicate at first, and the fact that you went out and went back, just like Gavi wanted to, and your strength. Know that, brother, big heart. We see you. A lot of our listeners felt your pain and your steadiness. And hopefully, there will be brothers and sisters out there that wants to team up with you. You see, what you dreamt about was a dream that many of us thought was impossible. And I have a phrase. The phrase is, the impossible is the dream. When we set out on a journey to accomplish anything, the challenges will come. What you've done for us is make us privy to certain things that might happen on this journey back home. And no one told us that you know, 
the level of sickness that could occur, the challenges. No one will pave a better future for us as men and women of African descent but us. You're the foundation for the next generation. There is a 20-year-old young man or woman listening to this, and they're going to reach out to us, and they're going to look for guidance. Because this is what Gavi wanted. What you're doing is exactly what our ancestors wanted us to do. It is not about being complacent. It's about doing and learning. And now because you have done this and us listening to you, you're now one of our experts on the journey. I welcome anyone who wants to reach out to this brother and team up, partner up, because this is the doing kind of show. In future shows, I'm going to teach people how to design fashion stuff, how to do certain things to make money. It's black power money. Gone are the days of worrying about politicking and polytricking. Gone are the days of extensive discussion about who's wrong or right. We're not in the business of agreeing to disagree. Moving forward as a new generation, we're in the business of doing. We respect those who have done work. So even if you want to be on the show, you could email me, and I'd love to know what you've done in your life and what your intentions are as far as being an African descendant. But brother, you know, listening to your story, I think it will give many hope. And um, we, we don't want to ever lose hope, and we don't ever want to be afraid. You've paved the way, and we want to make sure that this audio goes out to similar-minded individuals. My principle is that there will be no unity. We're different, different ideas, different feelings, but there will be agenda unity. We've heard about AI. Now we're into the AU. It's agenda unity. The agenda is always, like you said, plant food for yourself, own your own land, Malcolm X. The land is the revolution. And Pan-Africanism or perish, Dr. Henry Clark. You have accomplished these things. So a movement with gathering of she-goes and egos never, never really work. A movement of doing, bartering, and business mind, and intellectuals who want to get things done. And that's where you earn the great stars, the great accomplishment in your life. You're a brother that get things done. And chartering this course all the way back to Kenya, not knowing the outcome of your life, almost losing your life, this is what our conquerors have done. And if we do not do what our conquerors have done, we will never govern the future of our country, community, or family. So, my brother, you know, it's, it's, it's been such a great um, experience just listening to you. Because my kind of shows... I want to just speak to people who are doing things, who could share information, who people could reach out to. And the reason why I want to filter out people until we move forward, later on in the months to come, I will see the type of people that reach out to me. I want to filter out the noise and increase the the doing, increase 
the communication with those who want to do, those who want to, to join a movement of a collective of doers that are making the necessary journey to do as our ancestors and our teachers wanted us to do. So hopefully my future shows will be similar to the size of this one, but you've set the tone of the kind of conversation I want to have. Normally in my life, I say to people, I don't care who you are, what you know, tell me what you've done. The experience, the practical experience that we could pass on to the next generation to build businesses, systems, re-educate ourselves, books. Give me your product. Don't give me your ideas, your emotions, or your opinions. I've always been that way because I've realized that we, as a people, we have opinions, and the easiest thing for us to do is to agree to disagree. And we will do this all day in the comfort of a westernized system and a colonialized system. We cowardly agree to disagree because we're afraid to actually go and charter the path less traveled. And how you know me is by seeing that I travel this path less traveled. So this Brother Ron show, for me, if I have never done another one, is, 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 is very satisfying because I'm able to listen to a story and I could live that story with you and many of our audience could listen and live this story with you. And I hope through this um, show that we'll find similar minds like ours, the agenda unity. Unity is weak among people that will have differences in different directions. In our minds, the agenda is an African-based agenda. Land. So once our agenda are aligned mentally, all the other cultures, they have an agenda. The agenda is to own is to protect resources, is to legally prevent. So our agenda, once we are aligned in agenda, that will become the unity. From one Jamaican Gaviite to another, we're coming for no, because our ancestors have set the foundation. Unity will need an agenda. And my brother, I commend you. And then hopefully others who have the same agenda as you will team up with you and we can see this Pan-Africanism working, something being done. The days of knowledge, Pan-Africanism, banter and emotions and passion, those days for us our past tense. In this new generation, because of the digital world, we can do now. We can connect. We, you can be a Muslim. I could be this. And we can have a common agenda. The challenge with us We've never had a common agenda. And if, if, if 10 of the items in our agenda, if only one we can share, land ownership, passing on that to the next generation. So the first question I want to ask you is this. Now I want you to go on another um, teaching moment and tell us, what are some of the things that you could have done differently health-wise? Could have been certain things to prevent your ailments. What are some of the things you would do differently or 
allow the next generation, now that you've paved the way, moving forward with your business and farming, teaming up with other business-minded like you, if possible, what are some of the things you would do differently? Talk to us. You've learned the lessons. What would you have done differently? And how would you prepare other Pan-Africanists just like yourself when they arrive? Give us some of the pointers. Guide us to more success. Go ahead. Well, it's hard to say um, what I was, what I would do differently, um, only because everything, everything was a lesson, right? There wasn't a predecessor to say, "Do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that." You know, I had to. I feel like I, in hindsight, I had to go through what I went through to learn. Right now, if I say in hindsight, as 2020, um, honestly, from a you know, for pneumonia in a very dusty place, I don't know how I'd be able to avoid that. Malaria is just a thing that's it's it's bound to happen. It seems like every African gets malaria every few years or so, something like that. You know. Um, some things are unavoidable. Um, in 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 terms of the location of the farm, maybe I would have done that a little different. There are places in Kenya. They don't necessarily have the farm business infrastructure, but they have the land and they get a lot of grain. So I would have been able to avoid a lot of the the, the money I spent on fuel. Uh, having to have pumps, you know, we have places in Western Kenya on the border of Uganda that are lush green places, but they don't have the farm business infrastructure such as the the the, the agro businesses that sell the fertilizer and the the pesticides that are necessary for commercial farming. And I know a lot of people they believe that. You know, you don't have to use chemicals, but to be able to compete on a commercial scale when it comes to farming, and I know 17 acres is not a lot, but in Kenya, that's a lot. You know, most people are working with maximum three or four acres, you know, and, you know, Kenya food infrastructure is kind of like a conglomerate of thousands of people with three or four acres. You know, me having 17 acres is very substantial. So on a commercial scale, you you almost have to use pesticides and chemicals and things like that. The African insect is very aggressive. Um, so probably, you know, push myself into a different area. I'm more or less so maybe going into doing what I'm doing now first, conquering that, and then going into farming. Because I always had my um, internet base work as a backup plan, but farming was already primary. But I, I, I said a few times that maybe I should have done this first and then pivoted to farming. Um, but I, I don't regret the experience. You know, it, it's very rough for me right now, but uh, I don't regret the experience at all. You know, I, if I'm able to pull through this, there's nothing really that can stop me. Um, I, I've actually lost weight. I feel like I'm stronger. You know, the trials purify. So, you know, I'm I'm a better human being for having put myself through it. You know, albeit extreme and having done it in a relatively short amount of time. You know, a lot of people tell me I probably should have gone at a slower pace, uh, which is probably true. But, um, you know, if there's low-hanging fruit, why not go out and grab it, pick it, and do it, you know? Um, so to answer your question, I honestly, you know, from a health perspective, I don't know how malaria is and pneumonia would have been avoidable in that situation, especially in a village location um, where, you know, mosquitoes are very aggressive things like that, and it's pervasive. And something like in that place where tuberculos tuberculosis is, um, and me being in close proximity, and luckily I had tuberculosis shots, right? Like I was with my manager daily, 
and we'd be in close confines of that car. We'd be talking for hours about the business of the farm. Um, you know, and tuberculosis runs rapid in that area. So just, you know, know what you're getting into, right? You, you have to, there's a hardening process that you have to go through prior to, at least from a mental level, and then being able to endure when you get here. If, if that's what you so choose, like, I don't encounter, I encounter many of my brothers and sisters here because they choose to live in locations that are closer to Western lifestyle. I knew that I, when I came, I would be living more among local people and then closer to rural areas as well. So I was ready for that. So yeah, that, that, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, 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 definitely. That did. And um, again, you know, uh, if you grew up in Kenya, you, your system probably would, you know, already adapt to the environment. So the ailments and the sickness, your body would get used to over time, you know? So that's. I can't even tell you how many times I had wild diarrhea. I'm so sorry, so talk, to, <laughs> talk to me about the fill. What kind of water you were drinking? No, I drink bottled water. Um, but so, like, it's just from certain food, the way it, I, I don't have the gut bacteria uh, to handle here. And people just seem to like they can drink water from the pipe. Oh, and they, and they, they're good. They're good. You know, I can't even think about it. If, I, if one drop of that gets into my system, I'll be down for a week. I mean, when I first came, I had, I had, oh, it was so bad. I had one episode so bad. It lasted for about four days. And I had to be mindful because, you know, diarrhea takes a lot of fluid out of your system. So you have to keep, I'd stay hydrated. Um, but that I get about monthly when it comes to, you know, it's, it, my, I'm, my system is stronger because of two years now, but it's still not, it's still not like I'm from here. So I was just saying, speaking that statement to your point that in my system is different because I'm not from here. Got it, got it, got it. So now what what we're learning from this is that making a transition so drastic um just even like in Jamaica with water in certain rural areas trying to make that leap from western system into a rural african system it's 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 a challenging ordeal you would say that right indeed yes Good, good. But at the same time, it can be very rewarding if we figure out ways, because it's been done before. As we get older, our immune system would have to go into immune overdrive and be very cautious, even wearing masks, you know, when we're around certain people. Just just to, you know, we're, we're, you're going into an environment that is just new to the body. You know, it's natural on Earth that it takes time for the body to build an immune system based on location. But we still have to do this. We have to go to Africa. We have to purchase land or lease, and we have to do farming. So this has to be done. It's not a matter of you're going to get sick. We just have to prepare for that. This is something that you've taught us, and this is so vital and important because food being primary this this constant um, thought about Africa means that we have to be self sufficient and purchasing land um, to make sure that we could we could take that leap and we could do this farming. What are some of the? Um, you remember? Um, I'm going to have you back on another show, depending if the users comment. And they say, Brother Ron, love it, love it, love it. I want to have another show with you because there's something else you want to talk about, Africans from the diaspora. I mean, not from the diaspora, 
uh, African descendants. And um, and we're going to talk about that, hopefully, based on the comments. So if people like this show, and if they put thumbs up, thumbs up, and if I get a certain amount of likes, over 1,000, 2,000, and a certain amount of comments, um, people who want to reach out to him, you could make comments, and we'll take a look at that, and then I'll see... I will let the people lead if this is the kind of content that they love to hear more of. I personally don't really want to be a part of this YouTube podcasting about what we agree to disagree on, you know? I love the fact mm -hmm. that I've known you and seen your journey, and I could talk to someone of your caliber from Brooklyn, from the U.S., who's had the struggle. So anyone out there would love to reach this good brother, I'm going to upload this as is. We call him Mr. Big Heart. We're, we're men that are trying to um, be men for our future families. Another question, what about if there's a lady that wants to come in your life and continue farming with you and make sure she takes care of you so you never get sick again. <laughs> Are you open to that? If there's a sister out there, want to reach? Because brother, with that nine acres, are you intend to have a more family? Well, talk to me about that. Aren't you looking for that lady that will now come in, embrace and help you with the struggle? So when you get the fever, she could take care of you. Talk about that. Karibu Kenya, welcome. Karibu is Ken. Ka welcome. Karibu, welcome to Kenya. Karibu Kenya. You know, um, any any anybody, any sister, you know, any brother, anybody. You know, um, it, it takes a it, just, it takes community, right? It takes like when you see people like you see in Jamaica, you see Chinese coming. They don't come alone, right? They come with with a group of them. They sustain each other, they level each other out, they make sure each other is okay, and they build there together. You know, um, ideally, I would have loved to have done that here, right? Because there are so many out there. I mean, and the startup cost for even the most basic business is not much. You talk about if you want to start a restaurant, you're looking at like $500 to $1,000. You know, where I'm staying now, like rent for a very small space it's like forty dollars a month in a business location right so yeah definitely you know everybody women sisters you know i, I know it seems like from my, my what i'm seeing a lot of sisters seem to be more willing to leave and take that risk because I, I, I know there's a community in Tanzania, and a lot of sisters are there. I know I've heard many stories, a lot of sisters in, in, that have moved from America to Gambia, to Nigeria, to Ghana, alone. You know, so Kenya is also an option also uh, in that. Uh, don't overlook a lot of play, unknown places like Malawi, Gambia, you know. Uh, even I tell Kenya, before you decide to go to Europe or America, there's places in Africa that need your talent because the Kenya, Kenya's literacy rate is high, their their education standards are higher, you know, instead of, you know, kind of similar to, you know, places in America, like if you live a big city in America, you go somewhere else. <clears throat> instead of fighting it out in a large, overly populated city, you go to another part, you might thrive a little bit. So here, Kenyans we have that opportunity to go to other parts of Africa and really thrive because they need that talent. You know? um, so yeah, definitely Kenya, Kenya is an option. There are, there are several kind of regional places in Kenya, the coast, which is totally different from central Kenya. Then you have like the northern part of Kenya, and then you have like the western part of Kenya, close to the Uganda side. Um, you know, different kind of, I've been to all, I've been all over Kenya, all over. I was very serious about looking 
before I finally wanted to settle, before I found a place to So, yeah. And Kenya's open. So now if there's someone who wants to reach out to you, they can reach out to us. The email is on the screen, brotherron1 at gmail.com. And our screen will do serious people reach out only. Um, we want you to be a consultant to them. You know, they could book your time. A lot of people out there, you know, there are a lot of jokers out there. And we want to make sure... We only communicate with serious people who have serious aspiration of that African journey. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going to filter. You know, there's a lot of um, loose-minded people out there. And when you have a mind like yours to share, we have to make sure we only deal with serious individuals moving forward. But definitely with nine acres... You should be able to find someone to team up with, build some geodesic dome for Airbnb. Tell us about the attractions near you. If you were to build some geodesic domes on your land, fly some drones and invite people to stay on these properties and visit the local areas, talk about potential of uh, safari. What's, what's around you? For, for tourism, or what? Why would I want to come to Kenya, where you are? Well, where the land is situated, there is um, Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, part of it, part of it is in Kenya. Majority of it is on the Tanzania side, but uh, the view of Kilimanjaro is just there. It's about an hour's ride away to get to the the base of the mountain. Um, the land is actually situated on the south side of Savo West. Savo East or Savo West? Savo East. Sorry. Yeah, Savo East. And it's also on the border. You can like literally, when I first, well, the first day I went to Lloyd Talk Talk, I walked into Tanzania through the bush, like not, not even through a border crossing to show my passport. They were like, one side of the land was, was Kenya. And they're like, okay, now we're in Tanzania. We didn't see a line, nothing. We just walked. So the land is just on that border between Kenya and Tanzania. In the Kilimanjaro region, there's uh, Savo National Park. Um, well, but if you really think we live there, you can find giraffes on the land at some time of the year, too. <laughs> but uh, also Amboseli National Park, too, is another one as well. Um, it just depends on the season, time of year you see uh, the animals. There's uh, Lake Chala, which is in a, near a town called, in about an hour's drive away, um, in a town called Tabeta, Kaveta, another town that's on the border of Tanzania. Um, there's a road that kind of runs parallel. So there, there are things to do there. But you also have to keep in mind that that it is wilderness as well. So, you know, there if, if if that's if that's more of the experience you seek, definitely the the the, the, the more edgier wildlife or wilderness type of uh, accommodation, definitely. Um, of course, you know, with the national parks, they do have more of the standard layouts but you you wouldn't be too far from the entrance i've actually driven you can actually drive there's you get to the gate of the national park you pay about 15 dollars you drive through and you can you don't even need to i didn't even need to hire like these wildlife safari services i just drove in my truck through I couldn't believe it. You know, these things you see on YouTube and people are seeing lions and stuff like that from these big sport utility vehicles. I just drove through in my truck, you know, and we're seeing giraffes, we're seeing impalas, we're seeing elephants, everything. And uh, the experience in the, is, it's the quietest place. Like I like to get up in the morning and, and uh, the very dark hours of the morning to listen to the silence. And I've been doing that since I was 21. And in this place, in the National Park, 
was the quietest place I've ever heard in my life. Like the silence. It was it was serious. Like the peace that's in these places. You know, I, I just wanted to add that in there, what my experience was uh, through there. Because I did spend the night there before I drove out. And it was it was quite something to be hoped. But there's a lot we're missing living in Western culture. A lot. A lot of understanding that we miss too. Because we're just not in touch with certain things. That's great. Now you've grown and I'm, I keep extending this show, but it's it's such a pleasure. You've grown spiritually, right? How have you grown spiritually? How have you changed? And what are your thoughts on the new development of the world today? First, how you've grown and how you've changed, you know, your, your, your aura, your demeanor. What, how better, or what makes you a better man now? And then after that, touch on the issues with um, Niger. What are your perceptions now from being in Africa, what, two years, three years? How long? Two, two years, two months. Two years, two months. How have you grown change, and what are your perception of the new world? Go ahead. Um, well, you... You know, being from a Western country or not even being from there, if you you migrated and lived in a Western country for a long time, there's a certain naivety. And you were, you learn that the world is a very ruthless place, right? Like, and you, you, you really have to understand that. Um, that kind of Western countries kind of coddle you. And if you are not serious about what you want in this life, you'll just be running on a treadmill. You, you, you have to learn the ruthlessness of the world. Um, and that's what I learned. You know, that's, it, you know, some people won't see it as growth, they kind of see it as dark. But um, I, I'm, I'm happy I learned that, the, you know, you're not going to get what you get in America. And that's a good thing. You know, it just makes you a little more resilient. It makes you a little more keen and observant about what this world is really about. But people are not people are not playing. They're very serious people. They're not into foolishness. So, you know, you, you that that definitely helped me grow. Also, just putting into practice the things I was ideal about, right? And seeing, um, seeing that I, 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 seeing seeing something that even my mother dreamed about. My mother was very much loved Africa. She kept African artifacts. She made African dresses. You know, and everybody in my family, they say, your mother would be so proud of you. She passed away when I was 19. You know, so just being able to put that in practice and see, you know, and, and having the clarity of mind and the, you know, the feeling of accomplishment that this is something that I always, that I've thought about for a very long time, at least. Um, in terms of what's going on in the, in, on the continent now. Um, from what I see, and as you and I discussed, I see the impacts of brain drain. And that's not just in Africa, that's in most developing black countries where the smartest people, the most educated people, the most talented people from these countries don't live in these countries. So as I said before, majority of the smartest people from Jamaica don't live in Jamaica. Your brightest doctors, your brightest engineers, your brightest lawyers, that's not to take away from any of these countries. They have very smart people. But the smartest and the most trained don't live in those countries. The ones with the most experience don't live in those countries. So you see the you see a lot of the impacts of what remains in those countries, right? When your literacy literacy rate falls off, when your planning falls off, and you let the country, you know, you don't even contribute, right? As I was saying before to you in our conversation, if you just, some people, and they haven't been back to their country for 20 years, they sit in their living rooms in Europe, Paris, in New York, and they talk about what's going on in the country, but they don't do anything about it, you know, and that that's something that, that 
there has to be something that changes that because you have to find a way. Even if you don't want to come back and live, or you haven't invested, you know, um, I encourage those to do, you know, to, to make that a goal of theirs, um, to, to really work towards that and find a way to contribute meaningfully other than having just conversations about what's happening there uh, because they need you. Because you see the what I went through in the farm, they call it Shamba. What I went through in the Shamba was a result of the brain drain of him, you know, the, the lack of reasoning and stuff like that. And again, that's not to insult anybody that's here, but when you talk about the collective consciousness of the people, they need their most talented to be present to raise the collective consciousness of even the least man in that society, if that makes any sense. So, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, what happens in those countries that are going through turmoil right now is the people that are left there, minus the most talented ones, they are going to be at the mercy of whoever is coming to invade them. Because the people that are coming to invade them are coming with all of their talent and all of their technology. And they will be completely over it, no matter. And I, I don't know how you feel. So that no matter how much you put up PLO Lumumba videos or Dr. Julius Lama videos, that's tough talk. But that means nothing to the people on the ground. And you can talk tough, but that, that doesn't give you the power to overcome your opponent if your opponent is stronger. Like there, I read Gone with the Wind years ago. And the key was the South, they talked tough, but the North overran them with their technology and their talent. They didn't have to talk. They didn't have to talk tough. So that, that's my assessment of the situation, if that answers your question. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. So this is the first Brother Ron show, and... Yeah, I think we did it, bro. I think, if anything else, you, your aptitude, your knowledge, oh, everything we did today, you know, th let this set in stone from one brother to another, you know, the level of respect I have for you as a real brother. You know, I think we are going to have a leading voice um, on this platform, but I think the only re way I want to lift up my voice is if the people that are listening, comment, like the show, ask for more, you know, I've done this for eight years, uploading digitized over 500 videos beside Mr. Clemson Brown. And I stayed in the shadows. It was not about receiving the accolades or the attention. I'm a real Gaviite. I'm in Jamaica now, and uh, my brother here is in Africa. We get things done. You know, I'm the main reason this entire archive has been uploaded, most of it. And most of the people don't know that I'm the one who physically did it. And that was my quest to contribute something that Mr. Clemson Brown took his whole life to build, and I promised him, you know, his legacy would live on. So I'm Brother Ron. Uh, you'll probably get to know me later on, but I'm stern because I've learned from Dr. Clark. I'm a student of Dr. Henry Clark. I'm a Gaviite, and I choose to have firm communication where we could build this beautiful nation, whether it's black or indigenous or whatever, has to be beautiful because we're a beautiful people wherever we're from, whatever we do. So my brother, being age 50 and wanted to start the show for so long, but not having the right topics or the right people or the right spirit, um, Minister Brown was laid to rest, rest his soul, on Saturday the 19th. And he's been my leader. And um, 
and know that he would be proud that we are continuing this network and uh, a lot of love to his family. We've lost a giant. I sat with him and I said to him, you're one of the greatest among us, but you're not telling anybody. And that's what I learned from him. If we stay in the shadows and keep doing and keep planting these seeds, the change will come that we want to come. I did plant the seeds by helping to digitize all this content. So support Brother Ron. As weak as I am now, with the strength of the listeners, hopefully I'll be strong again. But I've committed with bending knees, sitting behind a computer for years, building this network. But now that my leader is gone, uh, it's only fitting that I carry on. I want to give a shout out to Durrell, a brother, Mark, the family of Transatlantic, this network. We are not so much public. Sometimes we stay in the shadows because we understand the intention of those who do not want the program such as this to see the day of light. So as warriors, we stay in the shadows and we'll continue to get things done. For all the other warriors out there, support this show because without your support, you're not going to hear from me again. We're serious men getting serious things done and expect serious representation. We're Jamaican. Working with African Americans are indigenous and making that shift to Africa. Dr. Henry Clark dream will come to fruition. Pan-Africanism or perish. That is what we hold dear to our heart. Pan-Africanism or perish. So now, say the final word, my brother, from your great leader. Give us the philosophy. You are the phrases you would like to give on, on, your, on your cycle until the next time. Go ahead. Well, one thing I did want to say <clears throat> is, and we, I said this to you in conversation, and I'll say it in public, you're one of the influences that got me to Africa. So the first time I encountered you online, I saw someone that was doing something in Jamaica, something that I, my heart, I wanted to do. So you are, you are one of those people you're talking about, and you're greater than me in that, right? Because you actually built it. You're doing the things that, you know, slightly kind of a big brother for me in that vein. Um, also, another thing to the point you, you said with, um, with your leader is that we need technicians. In the age of oratory, great speeches, and even to a degree scholarship is over. We need, like you said, the, it's agenda unity. Agenda unity needs program managers. They need data scientists. They need data entry clerks. They need administrative people to document these things on video, to keep minutes, to write agenda items, to send out invites, to send emails like this. Our, one thing that has been lacking a lot of the movements of Black people is we kind of go from the oratory to doing the extreme and we don't have enough technicians. And one thing you see that a lot of other people do, they do a lot of the backroom work. They sit behind the computer screen, they put the programs together. They, those are the people in the background. If you look at any one of our celebrities, the people who work for these celebrities are the smartest people in the room, because these are the people that are actually putting together this product to present to the public. It's not that the celebrities are great, the, the the people that are in their staff are even smarter than them. So we need the technicians, the backroom people to step up and contribute in a backroom kind of way and in, in the way to put this thing together, to make this thing a production. 
all the way around. Those are the most important people. I used to work in the sales world and 90% of my work, I couldn't even get before the client because I had to sit behind that computer, make sure I documented and put everything together, engagement plans and strategies and things of that nature. That was the majority of the work. And that's gonna be the majority of the work going for us forward. Um, so um, last word, reparations now, um, speak the truth. And uh, you know, I look forward to future engagement with you and your audience. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Now that was I'm gonna let you off the call now. We'll talk offline. That was my brother, Big Heart. And um uh my people, this is Brother Ron. Um you could sign up at brotherron.com. That's B-R-O-T-H-E-R, -E another R for righteousness o n n another n for nation building i've been on this nation building path for near 30 years and look out for other shows i'm going to teach you a lot in this black power money movement i've done a lot and hopefully i could teach you what i've learned and what i've been building to teach you how to monetize Dr. Henry Clark said, we need to have our own underwear. We might not have the fabric yet from Africa, but we know how to work with China in a cheap way to start making our own underwear. Agave was about self-sufficient. I have my own coffee. I have my own vitamins. I have my own garments. We have to have our own. So look out for these shows. Sign up to Brother Ron. Send me email. Support through the Cash App. Make comments. But I'm getting a little weak. I need your strength. Peace and love to everybody out there. If you never hear me again, we were here. So big up to my friend, Big Heart, and to my brethren, Darrell, and all my African Americans, and my indigenous, indigenous Americans, right? Big up to my indigenous American people. Big up to those who still consider themselves black people. Big up to the African American people. Big up to everybody. It is not what we call ourselves. We're all universal beings. I don't care what tribe you come from or what your title is. If you need reparation on earth, you will need to have a certain title for that. No problem. But we're all infinite beings. So big up to all the infinite beings. All right? Blessings and love. Take care of yourself. Until next time.